All right, let's get our committee back. Um, so recess is over, and right now we have um, Group Ecovi appearing, Francine Levesque, spokesperson Charles Terrio, filmmaker and producer, and Andre Arpin, retired tourism entrepreneur. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, can we the do. the presenters hear me? Oui, on entend bien. Okay, oui. Merci. Okay, um, so you'll have, uh, Group Echo V will have um, 20 minutes for the presentation. And when 15 minutes is up, I'll put up my hand and you'll see you have five minutes left. If nobody sees my hand, I might say it in the microphone, but not to disturb your line of thinking. I just, I, I need to let you know when you have five minutes left. When the 20 minutes is all expired, there'll be 40 minutes of questioning. 10 minutes from each political party, starting with the official opposition. And before you leave, I'll give you a minute to say goodbye too. But for right now, we've got a 20 minute presentation from Group Echo V. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Bonjour. Uh, Hello. Mr. Charles Thériault is not able to be here. So I have André Arpin with me, who will join me for our questions. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Members and Minister, thank you for giving the floor to Ecovi, who represents the voice of people who, rep who live in rural regions. I am Francine Lévesque. I am the spokesperson for Ecovi Group. Our presentation is called Protect the Diversity of Our Forests. Ecovi is a group of citizens from Restigouche West in northern New Brunswick. Our main goal is to stop the application of herbicides and to promote change in forest management in New Brunswick. In our view, the way forests are managed is by no means sustainable, and we have been compromising the future of future generations for several years. In our opinion, a new approach must promote sustainable forests and increase economic growth. ECOV firmly believes that by protecting the diversity of our forests, I'm sorry, the diversity of my, our forests, we act against climate change since we support flora, fauna, human health, and reduce the risk of infestations and forest fires. Our expertise is our knowledge of the environment since we have always lived here. We have eyes to see what is happening in the forest and ears to hear the anger of the people of New Brunswick, their sadness and their concern. Climate change is happening much faster than expected and we must act quickly. We are already witnessing tra tragedies all over the world. To name a few, the fires in Australia in 2020, the fires in Alberta in 2019, floods in New Brunswick in 2018, 2019, snow in Texas in 2021, extreme temperatures in April 2021 in New Brunswick, heat waves in May and June, and more. Climate change even affects the production of our food. Periods of drought, torrential rain, all in extremes, it's very difficult to grow a garden. Today, we are not alone in writing to you as we have the support of our people behind us. In 2015, 98.5% of the people we met in the Kedgewick St. Kenton region signed the petition to stop spraying on our public lands unceded Wabanaki lands and under NB power lines. With Stop Spraying New Brunswick, a total of over 35,000 signatures have been collected across the province and brought to the New Brunswick Legislative Assembly. The big question is this, does our Acadian mixed forest in New Brunswick, make, made up of a diversity of tree species, coniferous and deciduous, need to be sprayed with chemicals that are probably carcinogenic in order to be profitable? Is it necessary and is it to the benefit of all New Brunswick citizens that our forests be sprayed with herbicides? And now, with climate change, is it still acceptable to clear cut our forests and then plant them with single species of trees, coniferous, spray them 
and thus destroy our dispersed forests? First, here are some facts. Trees do not capture CO2 with the same intensity throughout their lives. According to Evelyn Tsifo, assistant professor in the Department of Wood and Forest Sciences at Laval University, and I'm quoting, a young seedling with few leaves and needles does not photosynthesize, photosynthesize a lot. Gradually, it acquires fuller foliage and begins to store more and more carbon, end quote. So young plantations are not as important vectors as mature forests in protecting us against climate change. Second, as the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers explains in its report entitled Vulnerability of Canada, Canada's Trees and Climate Change, and I quote, all regions and forest types are threatened by climate change, but some are more vulnerable than others. With more significant warming will occur, the most significant warming will occur in the central and northern Canada, areas dominated by the boreal forest. When we talk about the boreal forest, we're talking about coniferous pine tree forests. The northern boreal coniferous forest is very well adapted to a cold climate and will experience relatively more warming than other, than other places. Increased fire activity thawing of permafrost and unsuitable trees post significant threats to northern species such as white and black spruce." End quote. So the spruce trees that are being planted across New Brunswick are species that will be threatened by warmer temperatures. It should be understood that the forest is first and foremost an incubator of life. It shelters, it nourishes, it protects a multitude of living species, including humans. The public forest must serve the common good of all. We all have the right to shelter, food, and to be protected. Public forests should only be used when private woodlots cannot meet the demand. In northern New Brunswick, our economy depends primarily on the forest. This is why it is so important to protect our forest resources. As mentioned by Madam Kim McPherson, Auditor General, in her June 2015 report, and I quote, we believe it is important for the legislature and the general public to know how the department protects and oversees the renewal of one of our most precious resources. The application of herbicides is part of the silviculture, silviculture program. It is important to understand that the logging companies are subsidized for spraying. So these chemicals are paid for by us, the citizens. According to Madam Kim McPherson still, and I quote, the majority of silviculture efforts are for softwood trees, like spruce. In addition to harming forest biodiversity, this practice could result in the exclusion of other potential forest users whose activities require other types of wood, like hardwood." End quote. Along the same lines, Mr. Andrew Harvey, in an interview to CBC Radio on the report of the Special Parliamentary Committee on Climate Change of October 24, 4th, 2016, he said that, what mo that more must be invested in mixed forests and that there are alternative methods for a sustainable forest. Let's talk about the other forest users. Those who use hardwood, for example, maple syrup producers. New Brunswick is the third largest producer of maple syrup in the world and we are very proud that our region, Kedgwick St. Canton, is the heart of this industry in our province. Our maple syrup producers are large companies providing high paying jobs and products around the world. During a dinner in Kedgwick a few years ago, Mr. Bryant Gallant, ex-premier of New Brunswick, came to tell us that the revenues of maple syrup producers had increased by a thousand percent in 10 years. But this does not seem to suit the forestry companies. 
we are told that the contours of the maple fields in our region are clear cut, often replanted and sprayed afterwards, which prevents the expansion of maple businesses. And this is well thought out by the industry. In our eyes, it is cruel and very greedy. These maple syrup producers cannot speak openly because they depend on the government to lease public land. Who is willing to take this risk in front of the rich logging companies? In New Brunswick, we live as if caught in a stranglehold. No one dares to speak. We encourage you to use Google Earth where you can witness these cuts. You don't have to be a scientist to realize the extent of forest devastation. Some people even use the word rape. When you spray, you kill hardwoods and create spruce plantations that will serve a single industry. We continue to encourage a monopoly that is already very present in our province. This monopoly is getting richer, more powerful, and even more difficult to part with. At the same time, we are killing the dream and opportunities for other users and young entrepreneurs. Tourism, for example, generates nearly $1 billion in revenue a year in New Brunswick. Our tourists are attracted mainly by our beautiful nature. Who wants to walk through a spruce, a spruce plantation? In addition, we spray the plantations in New Brunswick from the beginning of August to the end of September during the tourist season. You can talk about it with Mr. Guido Martel, who operates his tourist business near Mount Carlton. For three years, not in the entrance, but near there, for three years, blocks have been sprayed near his, his customers. It seems that our elected officials and representatives have no regard for the users of the forest other than multinationals. And what about animals and insects that have lost their habitat? Now let's talk about jobs. Industries that use hardwood, the wood that is destroyed by spraying them with herbicides, create many more jobs with far fewer cu cubic meters of wood. According to Charles Thériot in the episode 14 on the website is ourforesthours.com, he gives a few examples. A cabinet industry uses about 29.6 cubic meters of wood per job per year. A molding company, about 214 cubic meters of lumber per job per year. An exterior coating company, 555 cubic meters of lumber per job per year. Now let's compare with a softwood sawmill, 5,264 cubic meters per job per year. The numbers speak for themselves. To use our forest in a sustainable way, the government must regain control of the management of forests, which was handed over to the industry in 1982. A fair balance must be struck between what the forest offers in timber and any other economic field. Yes, there are alternatives to spraying. In Quebec, the use of all herbicides in public forests was banned in 2001. They then developed new silvicultural practices and the implementation of the forest protection strategy which contributed to the development of new products, in particular, a larger dimension seedlings. These 60 centimeter spruce trees, instead of 15 centimeters that are used here, are used to reforest sites with a high potential for invasion by competitive vegetation. This is just an example. Also in Quebec, they established the non-timber forests product industry in all regions. The Association for the Marketing of Non-Timber Forest Products talks about it as follows. Faced with so much diversity of products from our forests, we have much to be proud of our artisans. These non-timber forest products, with their enormous nutrient and nutraceutical potential, are increasingly used in the natural and pharmaceutical industries, all of which are rapidly expanding markets. 
These non-timber products are now recognized as effective vectors of regional development, which have helped to increase the potential or the tourist season of regions and in certain cases to energize villages around unifying collective projects." End quote. Isn't that the kind of future we would like to see for our rural communities in New Brunswick? In our opinion, the diversity of forests equals diversity of jobs. Diversity of jobs equals economic diversity. Economic diversity equals economic stability. The more variety of tree species we have, the more healthy forests we have, the more our future generations will be able to diversify their economic activities. In addition, a mixed forest has better resistance to infestations, for example, spruce budworm, and a better barrier for fires. We now know that what climate change has in store for us at this level. So why kill the diversity of our forests by spraying them with herbicides? The first action to take immediately is to stop subsidizing herbicides in the forest. We refuse to pay for our own po poison. You have to understand that the status quo is no longer a solution. You have to adapt and make the necessary changes to save what little is left before it is too late. And it is you alone, dear members of parliament and ministers, that this responsibility lies with. At this point, we would like to remind the Liberal MPs who sit on this committee of the commitment that was made by their former leader, Kevin Vickers, and I quote, the Liberal Party will eliminate the spraying of glyphosate on Crown land in a period of four years, end quote. Before closing, I strongly encourage you to do the following reading and listening, and listening to further your knowledge on the subject. Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science. And for francophones, Le Roundup, Face à ses jus de Marie-Monique Jobin. And I encourage you to listen to the episode of Enquête that was recorded in New Brunswick, dated November 21st, 2019, it's called La Forêt Désenchantée, The Disenchanted Forest in English. It was translated and produced by Isabelle Rocher and Marie-Maude Denis. Thank you for taking into consideration the voice of your people, the ones who voted for you. Since we still seem to have a couple of minutes, I believe, I would like to add certain points after having heard the presentations from this morning. First of all, it is more appropriate to talk about herbicides than glyphosate. It is too easy for the industry to change herbicides or to change the name and we'll find ourselves back to square one. Second, during a, co a conference with Dr. Thierry Grain, I think he sent you an email, he said, More we use herbicides in forestry and agriculture, more we increase the acceptable dose. We, were, we heard about this 0.2 milligrams per kilogram maximal dose this morning. So more we increase the use of herbicides, more the higher the acceptable daily dose is increased. You also have to understand that humans absorb glyphosate in small quantities over a long period. So we can't just think about today. We've been, it's not like eating glyphosate and then it's gonna be gone in a week. It's, we eat it every day because it's in forestry and in our food. In April, 2015, the, the PMRA, decided to continue recording products containing glyphosate in a letter that was sent by a group of citizens called Ecojustice Wilderness Committee and Canadian Physicians for the Environment, Equitaire, David Suzuki. All of these people got together to write a letter. 
it was intended for Health Canada, and the message was there were 118 studies that were used by the regulatory agency to assess the risks. Only seven of those letters were, studies were published, so they were not peer-reviewed. And a single of these seven studies, including cancer researchers, researchers considered that it was reliable. This could be found online. Uh, the 20 minutes has passed. I didn't want to cut you off, but I had no way of telling you because of the virtual aspect of it. But we really appreciate your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, we thank you for that. You'll now have uh, 40 minutes of questions from, from the members of, of the committee, starting with the official opposition. And it will be... Um, uh, Miss Monsieur Mallet, that's right. Ship again. Keep on going. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Levesque and Mr. Arpain, for taking part in this uh, Standing Committee on Climate Change. I have three questions for you. The first, the forest industry says that eliminating uh, the spraying of uh, herbicides would hurt the industry. What would you say to that? First of all, the spraying that's being done today is for uh, trees that will be uh, re harvested in uh, for 40 to 60 years. And there's a way of doing selective harvesting, and this would create jobs. It, it, this won't uh, cause them to, uh, to, to, to go bankrupt or anything. You can you can make phenomenal profits uh, with that. It won't destroy the industry. I mean, that's a little hard to accept. And I would add to that that you have to use the wood. If you should use private wood before using crown wood. And there's lots of wood there that people are trying to sell. I don't know if you're connected with uh, the private owners, but I receive uh, articles showing that every month they're trying to sell it. And if we, we're not talking about stopping it, we're talking about, we want selective cutting with a natural regeneration. And we have no problem with that. Thank you. If we were to take position that we would eliminate glyphosate Do you think there are alternatives when it comes to herbicides besides glyphosate that could do the same work? I specified that we're not talking about glyphosate, we're talking about herbicide. We can eliminate herbicides uh, no matter what its name. It's something that has to be understood is that when we talk about glyphosate, it's a, an element of Roundup. The Roundup is the product itself. And in Roundup, there's glyphosate, but there are other products as well. And these things um, stick to the plants. And scientific studies do not look at Roundup uh, completely. They just look at uh, glyphosate. It's sort of like um, uh, a cow, uh, it's sort of like ba baking soda. I mean, if you don't put the car, the soda, uh, the baking soda into the vinegar, there won't be any reaction. We'll put it into the vinegar and it'll react. And uh, the arguments are probably about just the glyphosate instead of the full product. So we want all the herbicides gone. Thank you. And do you have any knowledge, direct knowledge, of the negative impacts of spraying in New Brunswick or in other jurisdictions? When it comes to maple to trees, I mean, they won't talk about this uh, publicly because they're afraid of uh, the repercussions from industry and others. But when they uh, work around a maple plantation, it has an effect. I mean, I mean, there's a volume of ex of exposure, and there's uh, there are dominating winds that can that to bring the, um, 
that bring the product into the uh, maple trees and uh, there's always some that are lost for this reason and that's unfortunate because we're trying to develop the industry and we have a a dominating industry and there's no uh, consideration given to the other users so we can say that that is a direct impact on forest management and for our businesses thank you i will now pass uh, the the microphone to my colleague Francine Landry. Hello, uh, uh, Francine Lévesque and Mr. Arpin. I am pleased to say hello this afternoon. A few, a few questions. You have uh, EcoV. Can you tell us about that group? How many members do you have? And what are your uh, main objectives? Okay, the group has been has existed since uh, March 2015, and it's funny because for years that uh, that that you know we're always going from uh, mad from being mad to being sad, etc. But we have perhaps 12 people, and we're getting older, and that's that's where we start to meet because on the. Mer March 8th, and I think it was on the 21st March, uh, that the product had been uh, uh, declared possibly uh, cancerous. And so we started a, a petition in uh, Kedgewick, and uh, we had the support of a clear majority of people. And uh, we met people in Kedgewick, in that uh, rural community, we we counted uh, 1,100 people, and this, uh, the, these are, and we aren't, uh, and the 14 who didn't sign were people of industry. And then we did actions, always peacefully, but which attracted media attention concerning uh, pesticides and herbicides. And we had a 10 day uh, forced camping. And when they were, when you were talking about the winds of a while ago, we were there to be told after 10 days that it had already been uh, sprayed even before we got there because their schedules are very hard to make out. And it uh, seems we got, we thought we had gotten there just before the date, but then we were told that it had already been sprayed. And the 10 days that we slept in the forest, I mean, and you know, when it comes to um, uh, pine trees, uh, I mean, this is always uh, clear cutting. And I mean, it, it turns out that the last 10 days we were there, they had already sprayed. And we're working very hard with uh, Stop Spraying New Brunswick. And we uh, took part with uh, Carolyn Godarcy to many uh, sports affairs and. Uh, we also did um, uh, protests in Fredericton and even uh, protested with Irving or against Irving. And we're following everything that's happening throughout the province and we are joining all the groups because there are many different groups. Last year, this was on the Nipsiquit River, and then we were at Mount Carlton, and then we went in the Bathurst area and the people I mean, they're supporting each other, and we're always there. We're following this closely because it's important to us. And I don't know how many times I called my MLA. We sent all at least 500 letters to five um, different ministers who were under uh, Brian Gallant, among others. And we did everything we could to try and explain what we're saying. But also, we read the studies. I mean, on glyphosates, we follow that. And we are, we understand that there's a problem with glyphosate. But as a group, do you have a position on spring or the use of glyphosate in agriculture? We do not touch that field. I mean, we wouldn't want it to be to happen with that. We'd like it to stop with agriculture as well, but we know there will have to be some adaptation, but there are more and more organic uh, farms, but we aren't touching that ourselves because 
we know that we will be attacking something that's rather big. Uh, really, business, it's the business that, uh, that leads the province. It, they tell us, uh, you know, it, don't uh, go after us. It's not up to us. There's nothing we can do about that. We've heard that thousands of times. So we're not touching agriculture. Thank you. Those were my questions. And uh, thank you to you and the citizens groups for your, for your uh, engagement. Mr. Kuhn, right, do you have questions prepared? Uh, oui, yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Hello to Mrs. Levesque and Mr. Alpin. Thank you for your presentation. At the beginning, first question. The spring of glyphosate is concentrated in specific areas of Aristi Gouche West. Is it concentrated in specific red or is it spread out uniformly throughout the area? If you're talking about uh, forestry areas, it's all over because really they they have it they're spraying everywhere. But the greatest uh, concentration from 2011 to 2017 was done around Mount Carleton towards Saint-Quentin. That's where we find our most important uh, maple trees. We have uh, the, the largest uh, maple production areas there. And so, I mean, right now, all of the area of Kedgewick, uh, and then the next step is uh, plant the plantations, I can tell you that the quantity of wood that comes out, I don't have to be a scientist for this, but just come and spend a day with here and you'll see. My neighbor set up a camera and he calculated 107 truckloads. I mean, I go for a walk every day and I see five in 15 minutes. I mean, this is supposed to be a road where there isn't any trucking, but it's incredible. And we call them toothpicks. I think that they're cutting the wood for my grandchild. who It should be his wood. We have to leave him some. So that's why we can't neglect that. And when I talk about what's happening, it's the same thing in Sussex. It's the same thing in other areas that people are telling us it's the same thing everywhere. Thank you. So, w w how healthy is the forest right now in Ristigush West? What condition is it in? I mean, the, physically for people? Oh, the health of the forest. Well, we know that our cancer rate is higher than many other areas, but we won't touch that because for health, apparently that's special. But when it comes to our forest, I mean, I live it's, I mean, I can see how the water fluctuates as soon as it rains. We have, sp we have flooding, and as soon as we have a dry spell, all, all of a sudden we can't go uh, fish for salmon because uh, canoes keep uh, uh, get, get getting stuck everywhere. I mean, I've been in tourism for 30 years, and the 10 first years, we never saw that. It was easy. There were no problems, and now all of a sudden, whoops, all of a sudden, the water isn't going as well. There are dry spells, and there are flooding, and this is mainly because the, the clear cuts uh, do not protect the soil, and so the water uh, spreads out, and there were people who were stuck on the river. They had to be evacuated. So, I mean, the health of our water courses is directly affected because our forests are no longer playing the, uh, the role they used to play to regulate the water. Thank you. Would it be possible to have a role for people in order to set up the goals for forestry management in your area? Well, last week it was 
the first meeting of our new uh, village council. We went there and seven of our members were there. And I'm still the uh, spokesperson, so I read a text that we would like to form this, that since we're a rural community, we were able to put pressure so that the LSDs join Kedgwick. And now we are a rural community, so why don't we have the right, why can't we have a, our say in the way our territory, our, our forestry territory is managed? Doesn't mean we're going to stop all cutting, but it would mean that we could have our say as to how it's done. It could be selective cutting, we could have natural regeneration, we could have protected zones. That's what I think. Because we know that with climate change, there's, we're gonna have hard times pretty soon. Will the provincial and federal governments, will they be there for us? I don't think so. Because they're gonna have a whole lot of other issues to deal with. So it will be our municipal government that will have to take care of our needs and work with us. So if we can protect that today, it's incredible over the past week, the things that we didn't have, that didn't happen before, we are below a great big hill, so normally there wouldn't be any wind that we have like we have now. I mean, since the beginning of a, a, a spring and summer, I mean, it's incredible the wind, it won't stop. And so if we want to protect that now, that part, I mean, it's not the full forest because we know it's a provincial jurisdiction, but in local governance, and we were making, putting pressure when it comes to the green book and green paper and all this. And if we can get the support of your government, because I mean, you have to have trust in our people. The industry is one, but who is, uh, working the machines, who is doing all the work. I mean, it's our people, so it doesn't mean we can't do it. We can do it, but we want it done differently. And I understand that the industry always did it the same way before, and that's how they made their money. And uh, we, we don't blame them for that, but we want our money to stay here so that each of the members of our community have his or her share. Have you looked in the past, uh, have you seen a changing change in the, um, the movement of animals, etc.? The only thing I can tell is at some point, certainly, we see fewer birds. I mean, there's no more deer hunting in our area. It's been quite some, like that for quite some time. But at one point, a helicopter had been set on fire by protesters and no one ever uh, spoke about this. I think it was in 2009. It was when a movement had started. It wasn't even us, it was other people. And they had been, uh, uh, th there had been some spraying directly and there was a pamphlet that had come out a few weeks before that wasn't signed. I talked about people uh, they talked about uh, spring was not a problem. A few weeks later, that helicopter was set on fire. And for five, for five years, there was no spread the spraying there because the people were afraid to spray there because they were afraid that their helicopters would be put on, on fire. And when Rod Cumberland comes to talk, he'll be able to tell you the uh, deer that were there at the time, the herd had gone up quite a bit. So, I mean, we no longer have any deer hunting for years, and the peeper uh, can, uh, can't really eat um, a moose liver. I mean, I had a taste by, tested by an organism that said that they can't uh, uh, test uh, liver, uh, moose liver in New Brunswick. And I mean, if this was told to us by associations, I mean, I'm just a volunteer. I, I don't know any much more about that, but we're told that they do not test uh, moose liver in New Brunswick. So I would encourage you to send it outside the province to have the test done, to have legitimate testing done. I agree. Thank you very much. That's all for myself, Mr. Chair. 
Mr. Kuhn, uh, Mr. Austin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you folks for uh, presenting here today and uh, sharing your passion on uh, the issue around glyphosate. I just, I, I don't really have uh, many questions for you uh, other than I guess I would just ask what, um, what's your greatest concern? And I know you listed a couple in your presentation, but what is your greatest concern around the use of glyphosate on Crown lands? And does that same concern apply to uh, private lands as well, agriculture and that sort of thing, or is it specific to, uh, to the forest? Yeah, you know, it's specific to the forest. I think. Okay. <laughs> it's specific to the forest. It's specific to the forest. In our regions, there was a, an entrepreneurship culture. By taking away opportunities in the forest, by creating a monopoly for forestry management, it eliminated all that leadership we had in our areas. So economically, it's catastrophic. We are becoming more and more dependent. It's hard to find people who will speak publicly because it apparently, it's, it, I mean, this is killing all rural areas, that monopoly, because if you have resources that are available, there will be uh, dreams. And if you have dreams, you will want to develop them. And this is killing all the entrepreneurial spirit in our area from that angle. And, and I would say we are looking at something at our young people today. My daughter today talked about being having a climate, climate anxiety, and certainly, I mean, she is, uh, she is proud of what I'm doing. She follows what we're doing when I make presentations and all that. But I feel sad that this is making her more vulnerable. She just had a baby, and, uh, but when I've seen any baby, not just uh, my grandchildren, I mean, what a future are they going to have? I mean, is that is the industry going to benefit from that? Whereas we're making more, uh, we are making more jobs with hardwood. I think it is killing our young people. I mean, okay, some people are saying, "Oh, there's nothing we can do about that." I mean, we. It's like they're taking risks that they would take in cities. I mean, often people come here and they say, my God, that's dangerous. And it, certainly it's affecting our young people in that way. And we had a, a study done at a certain point by an anthropologist. Unfortunately, I tried to find the title and I've looked through all my documents. and wasn't able to find it, but she talked about uh, the people of Kedgewick in St. Quentin, the young people and St. Leonard, Leonard and other parts of the province. And she mentioned that, that there's a problem with young people, that they don't, that there's no control, that since we are, uh, since we are already uh, being dominated by the industry, we may as well destroy everything ourselves. Why not? That seems to be the, the adage. Again, I, I don't have any further questions, but I do want to thank you, Mr. and Mr. Levesque, for your presentation and your passion on this topic. And. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Merci beaucoup. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Minister Holland, go ahead. Bonjour, bienvenue, et merci. Hello, welcome, and thanks for talking to this committee today. My French isn't that well. I speak better in English. Uh, I was listening and taking notes. Now, I'd heard a couple times that you had indicated that uh, you're not a scientist, and that's fine, but do, do you have any professional designations as it relates to forestry or environmental management? I think my knowledge comes from the fact that we live in the area, we see the wood that's coming out, I hear people speaking, lumberjacks, and I can tell you that the lumberjacks call us they say, come and see the disaster. And this has been happening for years. And so 
All right. I mean, I'm a social worker, but Kate. Okay. For sure. Uh, that, that has incredible credibility, for sure. When, when you live there, you see it. Um, now, I need you to help me understand something. I was concerned by something you said about they're spraying everywhere, everywhere, everywhere up in your area. Now, last year, the province of New Brunswick, they only sprayed 13,000 hectares uh, throughout the entire 3 million hectares of Crown land. Now, from what you're talking about there, like, did, did, is that, is, was, were they spraying everywhere, uh, all of the Crown land up there? Because that doesn't fit with what the prescription was now, or do you have it itemized into private, crown, or industrial freehold? What? Le Conseil de Conservation. The Conservation Council, with Frank Johnston, presents us each year a map of the spraying that's being done. And what we know is that a great big part of the spraying is uh, between uh, Saint Quentin and Mount Carlton, that I can confirm that. Freehold up in that area? Do you know if it was Crown or industrial freehold or that, private land? That was Crown. That was Crown. That was Crown. Okay. Crown. I know. I was up there two years ago with Charles uh, Terrio in the uh, Kedgwick offices, and he was madder than a wet hen about a piece of land that was going to be cut. But we were able to get to the bottom of it and find out that that actually wasn't perceived as being a cut plan. So I just wanted to to find out, uh, because I know that we only did 13,000 in, in the entire province, so. Um, now, when it talks, you had indicated that private land or industrial freehold is not your concern, um, because uh, you spoke about Crown land and you spoke about a few things with subsidization of forest companies, clear cutting on Crown, everything seemed to be centered on Crown, but uh, you know, we're working on a system to bring a primary source of supply back to private wood. Now, if we do that, we're going to be uh, excited to be able to create opportunities for private woodlot owners, but that's going to increase clear cutting and spraying on private land, and that's not of any concern to you. It is. <laughs> what? It, it, it is uh, a concern. If, uh, it has to stop the subsidies on all that because the program that are uh, subsidized for private woodlot owner encourage the clear cutting and it, did, it didn't need to be like that. But sure, I mean uh, the subsidies are a separate issue but if private woodlot owners proceed to have an opportunity to put more wood into the system, clear cut more land and use herbicide to treat it, um, it, it doesn't sound like that's a concern to you. Is that? I'm a private wood, uh, woodlot owner myself, and select cut produce way more, to my point of view, than awesome. clear cutting and planting. That's one of 40,000. But if that does lead to more clear cutting, what we have to try to do is work up a strategy so that folks, you know, have a perspective. We've got the whole land okay. base to manage. So, in Quebec, they don't clear cut. No, and Quebec's volume went down 30% on that on that Crown land base, and, and I, I wrestle with what we do in the province well, of New Brunswick if we lost that type of revenue, I know. Well, uh, uh, if, if you would charge the proper fees for using the Crown land, we wouldn't be short of okay. uh, uh, income. We'd uh, love to talk about that. Now, we're focused on the herbicide here for, for that. And, and so the conversation, um, I listened intently, uh, we did talk about Quebec, we talked about a variety of different things, but, you know, uh, you know, we worked hard as a, as a government to get information out. Like, we currently right now have a forest mix of 65% softwood and 35% hardwood. Now, that's a 5% increase of the hardwood that we had over in the, in the 80s, you know, and we're completing the process this year of more than doubling the conserved and protected areas in the province. And we held the uh, increase to any crown land cutting for five years. So when I hear that, like, I mean, we've tried to get that information out, but it sounds like, you know, it sounds like if it's spraying doesn't stop, uh, am I hearing you saying that, that despite all of that work that's being done, if spraying doesn't stop, it doesn't matter? Well, if, if, if you clear cut in some area and uh, you, you uh, protect the regen, you wouldn't have any problem with that. Well, that's what well, it's, clear it's cuts that are protected. The clear, the clear cut and uh, destroy what would grow. I'm and not sure. I'm not sure I'm following. I'd like to hear more. Well, when you clear cut on, on land, if you go select to start with, and then you pr promote the regen to start, and then you go again and, and harvest the rest, the regen, natural regeneration is there. 
so it that, would grow. That's so pretty would... exciting because in New Brunswick, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but by the time we get to the end of this year, 80% of all the cutting on Crown land will be regrown naturally. So it is going to be an exciting day for for regrowth. It's, it's, it's phenomenal, yes. Like Absolutely it is. But, but what I, I guess where I was going... What's that, sorry? If we have diversity, we'll adapt with the climate change. That's what we're seeing. The beautiful thing is we've got more higher hardwood and a better dynamic mix than we had in the 80s of our of our wood. So, so we need to build on that with conservation efforts like you're talking about. But, you know, it sounds like spraying is the only issue that you're focused on. Are, are there other conservation areas like expanding conserved areas, um, you know, using up private wood or looking at that, uh, that uh, the Acadian mix coming back? like? Like, is there any any areas you see there that we're we're doing in the right direction, or is it we're just spraying and we're not doing anything of any value? Well, we see, for, from my point of view, we drive the forest quite a bit, especially when I drove tourists around, uh, and we we see clear cut all over the obsequious area being wiped out, uh, and the shortened up buffer zone of rivers, and they spray that really near to rivers and, and uh, it, it regrow the regrowth is spruce. So that's a, a major problem to us. If they would have, in the past, started to protect the region, we wouldn't have that question today. So you're saying that if we protect areas, put river strategies in place, enhance our buffer zones, move to a more diverse form of forestry management, that you're, you're not concerned about whether we spray or not? You just don't well, see... You I'm don't still see... concerned about the spraying anyway, because it's, it's a, a wrong way to, to work. You, you have to adapt to the future. And if you take area that you just want spruce, only spruce to grow, because of spraying, that's what happened. I, I got the uh, woodlot that uh, has been spread and it's plantation and it's dead under the, the plantation. Yeah, we well, gotta be careful for sure. That's why it's encouraging to see that we're seeing hardwood on the increase in the province of New Brunswick yes. over, the, yes. over the last 40 years. Uh, to my point of view, when I uh, fly around or I drive people in the forest, uh, it, the clear cut is way too big and it has a direct impact to, to rivers because uh, it, it doesn't absorb and there's no moss to, uh, under the trees to hold water, so it just slides quick to the river. But help me understand and go back there because we've got three million hectares of crown land and there's only uh, there's only uh, 420,000 hectares in in plantation. So I mean, you must be talking about the footprint of industrial freehold and private as well, because I can't get there on the math. Of course, of course, because it doesn't oh, okay, impact okay. to our habitat. Oh, okay. Well, I guess uh, your focus in your presentation is on crown land. So I was confused. Sorry. Uh, the thing is that, uh, for my point of view, you don't have that kind of impact uh, as a government on freehold because it's it's not the, the no but if you're flying over freehold and you're complaining about it being a clear cut i mean that's outside of the realm of control of government so i'm just trying to figure out which area you want us to target so i appreciate you clarifying and and i'm good i'm i'm i've got everything you're all right with it yeah thank you okay um <clears throat> thank you mr holland i'd like to thank uh ICOV. Group ECOV for being here today and providing a presentation for us. And I'll give you, uh, you know, a minute or so to say goodbye. And uh, like I say, we really appreciate you you both being here today. All good. We would like to thank everyone here. We hope that your hearts are open, open and ready to listen as well. I invite you also to come in our neck of the woods and come see. People are making movies about this. There are people that are making, uh, are doing flights over the land and explaining what's going on. There are so many documents available today, so we encourage you to continue to look into this. It's so important for climate change that we pay attention to this issue. Thank you very much. So let's just take five minutes until we get the technology dealt with, and then we'll then we'll have some uh, some more things to talk about.